in part four, we aim at proving the topological spectral gap result. This result was necessary to prove the existence of free boundary minimal surfaces of any topological type into some Euclidean ball by maximization of the first Teclough eigenvalue. So here in the picture, you have example of maximizers for genus zero surfaces. Uh, these examples were computed by numerical ways by Kao, Osting, and Ude. And we would like to, to perform the, the theoretical way to prove existence of these surfaces. For that, uh, we need two results, two kind of results lying on uh, this quantity. Uh, this quantity, which is a, co a topological invariance, it is the supremum over all the metric of the first Teclough eigenvalue. And the first result is the following. If this invariant is above the previous invariant for lower topologies, then you have a smooth metric which maximizes the function of the first Teclough eigenvalue. And the second result tells you that, well, you are able to, to, to build to, to, to prove these strict inequalities. Because if we take um, a surface with some metric and you perturb this surface by topologically by adding um, a strip and gluing it on the surface, uh, then we can find a new metric on this surface such that uh, the, the first Teclough eigenvalue for this new surface is above the first eigenvalue for the previous surface. So these theorem work together in order to, to prove that there is a maximizing metric and that these strict inequalities are true for any topology. So I recall this result because uh, we need to use this result for metrics such that uh, they are maximal uh, for the first Teclough eigenvalue. And we know that maximizers have uh, multiple first eigen eigenvalue. You have uh, multiplicity. And this is why this result is not uh, easy to prove. We'll see it after. So the idea in order to prove this result is very simple, actually. Uh, we start with a surface sigma with some boundary and maybe some genus. And we attach to this surface a strip at the neighborhood of two points, P0 and P1. And we assume that this strip is, in some sense, very small, has a small height, um, a small size, parameterized by epsilon. And uh, the strategy here is to compute the asymptotic expansion of the first Teclough eigenvalue as epsilon go to zero. And we bet that this first Teclough eigenvalue converges to the first Teclough eigenvalue of the surface sigma as epsilon goes to zero. And we hope that the extra term, the first non zero term in the asymptotic expansion, is positive. Indeed, if it is positive, uh, we are above the previous eigenvalue. Here, um, we cannot expect, in fact, that uh, it is positive, but we can hope for compensation coming from the length. Because when we add a strip here, we have extra lengths here, which is very small because uh, the, the strip is small, but positive, so that we can have compensation with this possibly negative term. And when we do the product, uh, we hope for having this term being positive so that it is above the first Teclough eigenvalue on the surface. So with uh, Hedrick Mathiesen, we tested uh, the most simple strip to, to glue here. Uh, we tested a rectangle, a flat rectangle. When we choose a flat rectangle, we need to have the scalings like this, epsilon squared, here and epsilon here. And we multiply by some parameter, I shall explain later. 
um, so that uh, the left portion, portion here and the right portion here corresponds to the added boundary for the new surface. And the, the portion here and here, so A1 and A0, correspond to the, the, the portion we glue to the boundary here. And why uh, did we choose these scalings? It's because this uh, rectangle has a spectrum too. And we expect that um, the limit of the spectrum of the, the whole surfaces, all surface converges to uh, the spectrum of this surface and the spectrum of this one. So that we have to compute at least the first eigenvalue of this uh, rectangle with Dirichlet uh, assumption here and Stickloff boundary assumption here. And when we do it as epsilon go to zero and we did the good scaling for that, we have a convergence. It converges to pi squared over 2h and um, this depends on h and it is important because um, by testing the first directly eigenfunction of the rectangle here uh, extended by zero on all the surface and testing it for the first take of eigenvalue of the whole surface, we obtain that this eigenvalue is less than uh, this value. So that if you choose the height to be very, very big, then this is very small and sigma epsilon is small. And we cannot prove the theorem because sigma epsilon has to be above uh, the, the first take of eigenvalue of the limiting surface C. In the same way, we can prove that if we test a first eigenfunction on the surface sigma, extended uh, as we can here, for instance, you take the harmonic extension in the rectangle, um, then we have that the first Taylor Fagan value of the whole surface is less than the, the first Taylor Fagan value of, of sigma, up to an error term coming from the harmonic extension. So this is very easy by test function. And we can also prove that, in fact, sigma epsilon has to converge either to this quantity, either to this one, so to the minimum of the, of the quantities. So let me give a simple graph uh, to describe this problem. Um, so we take on this axis uh, the eigenvalue and on this axis the parameter h, which is the height of the rectangle. You have here the branch of, egg, of the first eigenvalue for the rectangle and here the branch for the first eigenvalue of the limiting surface. So we expect that the surface sigma epsilon converges in some sense to the surface sigma plus the limit of the rectangle, which is an interval because the rectangle is very thin. So we have a thick part and a thin part as epsilon goes to zero. And actually we are able to prove that the spectrum of sigma epsilon converges to the union of the spectrum of sigma and the spectrum of the interval. So that the first eigenvalue has to be uh, has to converge to this. So this is a limiting uh, drawing, um, and um, this eigenvalue sigma star is the first eigenvalue for the thick part sigma. And here you have pi squared over two h. And remember that sigma may have multiplicity for the first eigenvalue so that in this drawing you have many many branches and uh, before the limit we would like to see what happens for the surface so let's argue with respect to the parameter so as I already said if we choose h to be very big uh, at this at this side of uh, of the drawing, then we cannot prove the theorem because it is 
lower than sigma star. Sigma epsilon is lower than sigma star. If H is chosen in this portion, it is not good uh, too because um, there is no reason to obtain the theorem uh, because we do not see interaction between the spectrum of uh, this surface and uh, the spectrum of the rectangle. The spectrum of the rectangle is too high and we would like to see in the analysis um, and in the spectrum that we change topologically the surface because uh, it is the change of topology which allows us to build a new metric uh, being uh, such that the first cyclophagian value is above the previous one. If we take a maximal metric, uh, we know that if we do not change the topology, we cannot be above. Um, so we must um, we must be on a portion such that we see in the analysis of the spectrum, the interaction between uh, the spectrum of this surface and this surface. So we have to be at the, the neighborhood of this intersection point. And in this case, we did the computation and we find that um, the, the first eigenvalue of uh, the surface sigma epsilon is controlled by the first eigenvalue of sigma minus a term of size epsilon to the one half. And it's not good because the lengths, the extra lengths uh, we hope to compensate this term do not compensate. Does not compensate because um, this is very, very small. So we cannot prove this theorem uh, in, this, uh, in this case. So just to, to see uh, what happens before the limit is exactly exactly this drawing. The first eigenvalue behaves like this. And the second eigenvalue be behaves like this. So that you cannot have any multiplicity, any uh, intersection before the limit. The intersection happens only at the limit and you have uh, a distance which is of size epsilon to the one half here. Okay, so the choice of geometry is not good. And we changed, we changed uh, the, the geometry of the strip. Uh, we chose the following cuspidal domain. So let me draw this domain. So we have a cusp. Uh, so the portion which is above the two curves here, x equal to minus y squared over two and x equal to y squared over two. So in this portion, we choose to truncate in order to have something which has the topology of a rectangle. And what we glue is this portion uh, a naught and A1 to the neighborhood of P naught and P1 as before. And we have uh, the added lengths I minus and I plus. And uh, this um, truncated um, cusp uh, has to go to the cusp as epsilon go to go to zero because uh, we want the length to be uh, smaller and smaller here in order to have a, a small height for the, the, the strip we glue. So we have uh, two parameters, this parameter here and the parameter epsilon times r where epsilon goes to zero and r will go to zero too. So for these domains, we are inspired by a previous work by Henrik Mathiesen and Anna Seifert in the closed case. Uh, in this case, they noticed that we can prove uh, also strict inequalities for the Laplacian. So we do not have surface with boundary, but we have surface with some genus and 
removing some disks and gluing a cylinder gives you a new topology such that we can prove that the first Laplace eigenvalue is above uh, the previous one. And the geometry they add for that is a rectangle a cylinder because we glue this portion and this portion in the hyperbolic half plane, half upper plane. So you have one here, R here, and the, the, the circle uh, we attach here is of size epsilon because we glue here to have a cylinder and we glue this geometry. And we see that this geometry here is very dissymmetric, like here. So that um, we have here um, a spectrum, the bottom of the spectrum, which uh, converges to the, the same value. Um, and it's the same in this case. Let me describe it. So for the, the computation of the, the spectrum of hyperbolic cylinders, it is very easy. So as before, we need to know how the spectrum of the strip behaves. And for hyperbolic cylinders, by separation of variable, um, we are able to compute eigenfunction and, eigen, and eigenvalues. In fact, for uh, the, the hyperbolic metric, the, the value one fourth and the function of y to the one half are very known. But here, because we truncated uh, the, the hyperbolic uh, per plane, uh, we have this, uh, this function uh, and these extra terms, which uh, have some convergence as r goes to plus infinity and epsilon goes to zero. So for instance, if we look for uh, the bottom of the spectrum, uh, we have that uh, all rotationally symmetric eigenfunctions uh, with L go to zero converges to one fourth as epsilon go to zero and R go plus to plus infinity. So we have an infinity number of, of branches of eigenvalues converges to one fourth and all the other branches of eigenvalues converge to go to plus infinity so that we, we do not care about this function actually. Because what we would like to know is how the bottom of the spectrum of the, of the hyperbolic cusp in, have interaction with uh, the, the, the surface, the, the thick part when we glue it. So we are inspired by, by this example to compute the spectrum of cuspidal domains. So here I changed a little bit the point of view. Um, instead of taking the, the Euclidean metric, I take uh, another metric on a somewhat fixed domain. So we truncate at one and at R, and we take a metric this one so that we have length epsilon here. And this is isometric to the previous representation of the cuspidal domain. It's more practical to work with it. And in this case, we do not have any separation of variable argument to compute eigenfunction and eigenvalue. This is the problem. But we can be inspired by the hyperbolic case in order to compute eigenfunction, and we bet that the, the eigenfunction of the bottom of the spectrum uh, just depends on the variable y, up to a, a very small term. So that the, the Dirichlet energy, which is equal to this on this domain, um, satisfies that the first term, the term which depends on the variable x, disappears. So that you have this integral with respect to the variable y. And 
for the L2 norm on the boundary corresponding to the, the, the Steklov uh, boundary condition. Uh, we know that it is uh, almost something flat or something with, uh, with straight line, straight boundary and parallel boundaries up to a, a scale epsilon squared. So we have this integral. And what we have And what we guess is that as epsilon goes to zero, the, uh, the Rayleigh quotient of, uh, of our problem, of Steklov uh, problem on the cuspidal domain, coincides to Rayleigh quotient on the interval for this uh, numerator and this denominator. So that the, the bottom of the spectrum has to resemble to solutions of this equation. Uh, it is an ODE, depending on the variable y. And we obtain uh, a natural ansatz corresponding to the good change of variable we need in order to compute uh, solutions of this ODE. And uh, instead of studying uh, the eigenfunction equation on u, uh, we study the eigenfunction equation on theta because it is very close to this ODE. So we make a change of variable, change of uh, the eigenvalue, the Steklov eigenvalue corresponding to, to, to Steklov eigenfunction for this problem are related to nu uh, by this formula. And nu is an eigenvalue for the new variable, new function theta. So when we want to study the eigenfunction equation on the cusp, uh, we prefer to study the, 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 the equation on theta. Now, let me give a strategy, a general philosophy to study the asymptotic expansion of eigenvalue and eigenfunctions. We have here, it is very classical, in fact, we have here a sequence of functions satisfying an equation. We have energy bounds coming from uh, eigenvalue, which are bounded, actually. And we have energy identities lying on eigenfunctions. And um, for asymptotic expansion, we have to, to play uh, and bootstrapping this sequence of thing. So first, we get energy estimates. Then we get convergence of sequences of eigenfunctions. They converge to a limiting eigenfunction, which satisfies a limiting equation. And we can use classification of the solution for the limiting equation. And then um, we improve the energy identities we had before on the difference between the sequence of eigenfunction and the limiting function. So when we do the difference, we want to study the error term. It satisfies an equation and improved energy identities. And we go back here. This gives you energy estimate on the given function and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we continue the asymptotic expansion. So this is a general philosophy. Here, uh, for more detailed things, um, we have that uh, the energy estimates are given by test functions for eigenvalues, for the variational characterization of eigenvalues. Uh, this gives you energy bounds for sequences of eigenfunctions. We use these energy bounds uh, on eigenfunctions satisfying an equation. And by elliptic regularity, for instance, we can pass to the limits and we obtain a, a function with satisfying equation on the limits. Then this equation uh, is characterized. You have a uniqueness, for instance, of solution of ODEs. And you have also uh, some kind of uni uniqueness solution of uh, the eigenfunction equation. And when we have it, we can uh, improve energy identities, improve uh, the, the, the equation, and go back here and, and again and again do the asymptotic expansion. So it's the general philosophy for our problem. And we have specific tools here. 
because uh, in fact we have a problem we have two domains we do not be we do not behave um, at the same scale you have the thick part so the, the part corresponding to the surface sigma and we have another part the thin part so thick part is this one sigma and you have the thin part which is the the cusp we glue to sigma so it is glued like this you have these p nodes here and p1 here And on the sig part, far from p naught and p1, you have standard elliptic estimates so that you can uh, pass to the limit in some sense if you have energy bounds. Um, you have also an equation on the scene part. And as we saw before, we do not study uh, immediately equation on u, but equation on theta, um, so that you resemble to an ODE with respect to the variable uh, log of y over log of r. And then we have to connect these two parts. And there are two things to, to notice. The first thing is that we have an energy identity, uh, which is uh, so, somewhat balancing um, uh, our, our problem because, um, um, for instance, if you assume that uh, this quantity is negative, you can control the gradient of uh, the function by the mass of the function. So you, 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 you obtain energy estimates of functions. And you can see in this uh, energy identity how to play ping pong and which uh, portion, in which portion you have to study uh, the asymptotic expansion in order to continue the asymptotic expansion. So, if this portion is negative, then you have to work on this portion. And uh, if it is this one, which is, uh, uh, I mean, positive, you have to work on this portion. And obtaining this uh, balancing energy identity is very simple. You take, you, you integrate the Steklov eigenvalue equation and you split uh, in the portion which is in sigma for here and the portion on omega from here where i is this portion and a is this portion. OK. And the last tool we have is uh, more subtle on eigenfunctions. Uh, we know that at the attaching part, uh, the drawing is like this. You have the cusp here, and you have the surface sigma here. So the cusp behaves as a scale as epsilon squared. So if you rescale the equation on this kind of domain, then you have ellipticity of the equation, ellipticity here, have elliptic equation, and you have also compatibility condition on this portion, which is a portion a epsilon. So that you have continuity uh, uh, and the continuity of the gradient, etc., and you can use it to, to connect this surface and this surface for the eigen function. And we also have equation at iterated scales close to p naught and p one. So here, for instance, was p naught, and for uh, the scale epsilon squared, you have elliptic estimates which connect to omega epsilon, but you also have elliptic estimates on annually, which are at all the scales between one and epsilon squared. And when we use all of these, we can rule out this asymptotic expansion. So let me give now all the steps of the, of the proof. So first, we look for upper bounds for eigenvalues, because this will give you energy bounds. And energy bounds allows you to make eigenfunctions converge in the thick part and in the thin part. So 
um, I recall that the domain we glue to the surface has this shape. It is a cuspidal domain. And here I introduce a new parameter, T epsilon, uh, going to some T star such that uh, the first eigenvalue of the limiting surface sig part is equal to this, which corresponds to the, the first eigenvalue of, of this domain, in fact. So as before, we would like to, to see interaction between the cuspidal uh, domain and the, and the sig part. And this parameter uh, is, plays exactly the same role at the, as the, the height parameter for the flat rectangle before. So we, we, we put it on, on the metric here. Uh, it is a dilatation parameter. And when we play with it, as before, um, we can give upper bounds for the first eigenvalue, for instance, by testing directly eigenfunction of the cuspidal domain, extended by zero on the surface, and we obtain this bound. So this is equivalent to the first uh, directly eigenfunction of the, of the cuspidal domain. And we can also test the, the first eigenfunction on the thick part, extended by its harmonic extension on the rectangle. And we obtain the bound, which is the first eigenvalue of sigma, the, the thick part, plus uh, an error term coming from the harmonic extension. OK, so when we do this, there is a, uh, something natural to do is to set r epsilon to be uh, exponential to the minus 1 over epsilon to the alpha for some constant alpha positive, because uh, we have this log of r epsilon squared here. Uh, and we want to compare uh, this square to epsilon. So it is convenient to set this. And notice that r epsilon is drastically small. It is very, very small uh, compared to epsilon. Now in step two, since we have uh, control of the energy, uh, and since the eigenfunction satisfy an elliptic equation on a on the thick part, uh, far from the attaching point, at least we are able to prove convergence uh, in any space you like. And they converge to a solution of uh, eigenfunction equation of the thick part. In step three, we use the energy um, uh, bounds um, and ellipticity of the equation at the intermediate scale at the neighborhood of P0 and P1 to have weak pointwise estimates of eigenfunctions. These will be useful to, to, to give pointwise estimates, even if they are very weak because we, we have estimates by log functions, but they will be sufficient to, to, to rule um, to rule out uh, asymptotic expansion of eigenfunction on the thin part then by connecting it to the thin part. But before, we need to choose the parameter t epsilon. So as I already said, I want to have interaction between the spectrum of the rectangle and the spectrum of the thick part. And the choice we do is to to, to have the mass of the first eigenfunction to be the same in the thin part and the thick part, so that the first eigenfunction has to resemble to a first eigenfunction on the thick part and a first eigenfunction on the thin part. So interaction is visible on this function. And why we can do this, it is a kind of continuity argument because if the parameter t is far from, uh, from uh, being equal to the t star, uh, then uh, at the left or the right side, you, you have either all the mass which is on the thin part or all the mass which is on the thick part. So in between, by a continuity argument, by some continuity argument, you, you are able to prove that uh, you have half of the mass in each part. 
Okay, now we are able to, to do uh, the asymptotic expansion of the first eigenfunction on the cuspidal domain. Uh, so thanks to the choice of the parameters, such that you have mass on the thin part, you, you must have that the first eigenfunction resembles to a first eigenfunction on the thin part. And um, we know by change of variable uh, we talked about before, um, we know that it resembles to this, where here we have theta, depending on the variable log of y over log of r. And you have your parameter nu epsilon, which is connected to the first eigenvalue of the surface by this formula. And actually, uh, we have more than this. We have by, by previous steps that nu epsilon has to converge to pi squared because you have a bound in the eigenvalue. In fact, we know that this converges to some eigenfunction. So a new epsilon has to converge to either 0, either pi squared, either 2 pi squared, etc. But since we have the bound, the previous bound, we know that it is less than pi squared. And since we have some mass in the thin part, it has to converge to pi squared. Moreover, uh, thanks to um, the, the boundary conditions uh, given by the thick part and the weak estimates of the step three, we know that um, the function resembles more to a sinus than a cosinus. So B epsilon is uh, bigger than A epsilon. So it resembles to a Dirichlet first eigenfunction. Um, once we have this, we put this information to the energy identity. So uh, we have the portion in the thick part, which is equal to the portion of the thick part. And if we put uh, this, uh, this computation in the energy, we know that um, this is equivalent to a term of order epsilon. Testing um, the first eigenfunction of sigma epsilon and the constant function for the variational characterization of sigma star gives this inequality. Indeed, before we have bound sigma epsilon controlled by sigma star, but this inequality uh, was not useful before because, because we wanted to have that sigma epsilon is bigger than sigma star plus something which is positive, plus something which is um, uh, negative. We would like it to be negative, but it is positive. And what we expect is that the added length here compensates uh, this term. So we are not far to have the theorem because uh, they behave in the same scaling. For the rectangle, remember, we, have, we did not have the same scaling and it was not good. Here, it is almost good, but we do not have the theorem. However, we can have the theorem in some specific cases. For instance, um, a posteriori, we are able to prove that A epsilon is in fact um, equivalent to u star of p naught, where u epsilon, uh, u star is the limit of u epsilon as epsilon goes to zero. In fact, we have a, a pointwise uh, limit because a epsilon here, if you uh, compute at p naught, um, you have that it is equal to zero here, and uh, you just have the term if y is equal to one, and you just have the term u epsilon of p naught. Um, and a epsilon corresponds to the value at p naught of the first eigenfunction. So that if you do not have multiplicity of the first eigenvalue on the limiting surface sigma, you are done because you choose p naught to be on a, on a, on a point such that the first eigenfunction eigen vanishes. And in this case, since uh, A epsilon converges to 
u star of p naught, this converges, this is a, a little o of epsilon. And then the extra length compensates everything and you have the theorem. But remember that we want to prove the theorem for metrics which have multiple first eigen, eigen, eigenvalue. So we have to continue the asymptotic expansion because uh, we are not sure that this is equal to zero. And in fact, it is not equal to zero. It will converge to uh, the eigen function such that this is not equal to zero. But here, um, we missed something because the, the test function we use were, were, were not very good, in fact. We, it is good to take the first eigenfunction for sigma, but the constant function is not a good test function for our problem. In fact, um, since we have interaction between the spectrum uh, of the thick part and the spectrum of the thin part, um, we have that the first eigenvalue converges to the first eigenvalue of the surface, it's clear, but also the, the, the following one. And in fact, we have a space of multiplicity k plus one of eigenvalues of the surface sigma epsilon converging to the limiting eigenvalue sigma star. So there, there are eigenfunctions which have mass only on this portion, and there are eigenfunctions which have mass on this portion and on this portion. And for instance, by the choice of parameter, we know that the first eigenvalue has mass, half of the mass on this portion and half of the mass of, on this portion. So we must have that the following eigenfunction um, have mass on uh, at least one of the following function have mass on this portion. And we, we want to, sub, to, to, to study the interaction between this new eigenfunction and the first eigenfunction. So this is the idea. So this is the, the idea in step, in step seven, for instance. Um, we first select another eigenfunction associated to some eigenvalue converges with, converging to sigma star, having some mass in the thin part. So as uh, I did uh, in my drawing, um, you, you have another eigenfunction having some mass here. Um, it is only linear algebra that makes you find uh, this eigenfunction. And then we can work, do the same analysis on, on this new eigenfunction as for u epsilon. You can also improve pointwise and energy estimates on, on both eigenfunctions so that you can pass to the limits. So in the thick part, the part sigma, you converge to some first eigenfunction uh, associated to sigma. And Actually, this first eigenfunction has to be the eigenfunction which is orthogonal um, to um, eigenfunctions such that uh, they vanish at the point p naught. So it is a one dimensional space. So it is either u star, either minus u star. It has to, to converge to this. Um, so for instance, up to take a sign, a sign minus, we choose, we choose u epsilon to converge to u star and v epsilon to converge to minus u star. And then the analysis gives you that u epsilon and v epsilon has to resemble to this with a, a plus sign. Because um, u epsilon and v epsilon are orthogonal before the limit. So at the limit, we must have different signs here and here. Then in step nine, uh, we aim at improving estimates for some linear combination of these functions to go further in the asymptotic expansion. So the main tool we use is orthogonality of u epsilon and v epsilon. It is this formula. It is a kind of uh, the same kind of as for the energy uh, identities, but we have this identity connecting 
these two eigenfunctions on the thick part and on the thin part. And thanks to this, uh, these estimates, we are able to compute um, very precisely um, the, the, the first eigenvalue um, on the surface and to get a bound by the, the first eigenvalue on sigma epsilon by testing this um, linear combination. Then we have the scaling exactly where alpha we are given by the parameter r epsilon here. And if we choose alpha to be uh, bigger than one third, then we have that this is a little low of epsilon and the length, the extra length, compensates this uh, loss of eigenvalue. And we obtain, in this case, the theorem. So thank you for the attention. And I'll see you later to answer to your questions.